So about a year ago, I finally bought a monitor along with a wireless keyboard and mouse to turn my laptop into a laptop desktop hybrid kind of setup. Uh, now a big monitor is awesome, allowing for better color accuracy, more space than my laptop's display, but what's even better is a dual monitor display setup. So a couple months back when my friend said that I could have his old non-functional IBM ThinkPad laptop, I don't know when they made those, uh, I immediately thought that I could have a dual monitor setup too, which is uh, also portable, battery powered, uh, by harvesting the display from that laptop, ordering a driver board for that specific display, along with a couple other parts, and lastly packaging everything together. Now before I start, I do want to say that Great Scott's video on his portable display project was of huge help for me during this project, and because of that, I will not be monetizing this video. I've linked his video in the description, so do go check that out. Alright, so after taking out the screen from the laptop, which by the way is about 14 inches, I needed a driver board. Uh, a driver board basically just plugs into the back of the display and allows you to plug in display inputs such as HDMI or VGA, which is something that we need. So I looked at the back of the display for the model number, searched it up on eBay, and ordered a driver board for it, which took its merry time to come. I think it was like four months or something. <laughs> but anyways, it did arrive, which is good news, uh, and it has HDMI, VGA, and DVI inputs, as well as an audio out to connect something like earbuds or speakers, and it can also be powered by 12 volts with the DC jack, which is a nice standard voltage. It also comes with a set of control buttons to navigate its menu, as well as an inverter circuit to power the backlight of the display. So that means the two wires you need to to connect to the display are the back connector as well as the connector for the backlight uh, that plugs into the inverter circuit and upon testing it with the Raspberry Pi which was connected through HDMI everything works. So now all that's left to do is make it portable and for that we can use a few 18650 lithium ion batteries which were harvested from a dead laptop battery. Uh, these batteries have a nominal voltage of 3.7 volts and a fully charged voltage of 4.2 volts and when they're dead it's 3 volts. Now since the driver board needs 12 volts not 4.2 or 3.7 volts what we'll need is a boost converter. I'll be using this one called the XL6009. So the setup then becomes three 18650 cells in parallel going to the boost converter which converts it to 12 volts and then powers the driver board. And to set the output voltage of the boost converter you can simply use a multimeter and a screwdriver to adjust the onboard potentiometer until it becomes 12 volts. And lastly to charge the cells since we do need to do that uh, I'll be using the popular TP4056 IC which has an onboard micro USB connector making it easier for us to charge these cells with with a smartphone charger. And that is all we need to make this portable. So the next step was to make a housing for everything. So I decided to use MDF to make the housing with these dimensions. I was also lucky enough to access the table saw at my school to cut the required pieces accurately. Big thank you to my shop teacher for letting me use that, uh, along with more tools that I'll mention later. After I had all the pieces cut from the table saw, I needed to cut the actual frame out from the display piece. Uh, so I used the Dremel my school had with a cutting bit. My friend helped me cut that, but at the end the cut was not perfect, which is just a limitation of using a Dremel for this. Also, since cutting with a Dremel takes a while because you have to go slowly or else the cutting bit will go flying off like this, we got impatient and tried using a chisel and a hammer, uh, which failed epically because the MDF split. But it wasn't a huge issue, I just used some of this industrial strength adhesive to glue it back together and everything was fine. I also used the Dremel to cut out the piece for the driver board inputs on the side piece and again, since it takes a long time with the Dremel, I cut most of it and then just used a box cutter on the rest. After that, I firstly sanded it with a Dremel sanding bit and finished it with files when I came home. Now all that was left before painting all the pieces was a cutout for the main power switch, a cutout for the TP4056 micro USB port along with the cutouts for its charging LEDs, more on that later, as well as a cutout for one of the buttons on the control board which is the power button. You may be confused as to why I need a power switch and this power button as well and the reason behind that is because the power switch will only toggle the power going from the batteries to the boost converter and the power button will actually toggle the display at the display button on the control board with all the other buttons from the driver board which is a function that I need to actually be able to do. So I then started making all the cutouts I just described. Uh, for the power switch I had to file a lot because I didn't have a big enough drill bit uh, but for the power button I only had these small buttons like the same ones on the control board laying around so I had to make do with those but more on that later. And lastly another couple cutouts I needed to make were actually at the back for these screws to wall mount the thing. I don't think I've mentioned this but uh, I do plan on wall mounting the thing. So I made the screw cutouts like you would see on a clock where the screw locks in. Uh, the plan for that did change as you'll see later but these were still needed in the end. After all the cutouts were made and the filing was done I gathered all the pieces and prepared to paint them. The fastest and easiest way of painting them all was to use spray paint so I bought this hockey colored bottle and I did one coat on all the pieces. Then I left them to dry overnight when they were all painted uh, and when I came back the next day I realized that I forgot to paint the inner side of the display frame so I covered that with paint and did the second coat on the paint that was already there on the frame 
frame in the process. As that was drying, I decided to assemble the whole housing with the other painted pieces, so I firstly put the pieces into a box shape and looked for any that needed some sanding uh, for them to fit properly, and there turned out to be one like that, so I filed that. When everything was filed and fit together nicely, I used some hot glue to hold the pieces in place and started nailing them together. And that's when I realized that using nails was a horrible idea, because even if they are really thin in diameter, they still end up splitting the MDF. So after ruining one corner with nails, I decided, out of my great wisdom, to use even smaller nails, only to find out that those split the MDF as well. So I just scrapped the whole nails idea then, and decided to use that same industrial strength adhesive that I used before uh, to join the whole housing together. So that's what I ended up doing, and let it sit for about 20 minutes to dry a bit. After 20 minutes, I filed the corners or parts from the assembled housing, which were sticking out too far, so that the box would look nice. After that came time to put the second coat on all the pieces as they were assembled together. Uh, by that time, the second coat on the display frame was done drying, so I took that off, put the assembled housing there, and gave it all another coat. When that was done, I left it to dry and decided to use the time to stick the display to its frame. So I got a piece of glass, put it between two tables, and lined up the display with its frame using the glass uh, to look uh, below and make adjustments as needed. And once I was happy with the alignment, I simply used the same adhesive as before to cover all the edges of the display from the back and left that to dry. And at this point, I just had to wait a bunch of time for the paint on the assembled pieces and the glue on this uh, to dry. So that took about five hours or so and the second coat of paint turned out to be really nice actually. It was clean, glossy, I was quite pleased. Uh, so I got the freshly painted assembled pieces uh, along with the glued down screen to see if they would actually fit inside and sit flush with the other pieces and it turned out it didn't. So to fix that problem, I firstly identified the side that actually needed some sanding for the display to fit, uh, marked it, and started cutting it firstly with a box cutter, then sanding it with sandpaper. And I kept doing that with a goal of making a display piece fit, but the progress had to be halted because, well, I ended up slicing my finger open. <laughs> oh no! No, 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 no! Yeah, that wasn't very fun to deal with, so try not to make stupid mistakes like that, like using a box cutter to cut towards your finger, not a good idea. So after dealing with that, I continued sanding and replaced the box cutter, because I didn't want to exactly use that anymore, uh, with nose pliers. Uh, and after a bit, the screen did fit pretty decently. So at that point, all the mechanical work was basically done. Uh, all that was left was the wiring, which also happens to be the much quicker and easier part. So I made a schematic of the wiring I did afterwards, which is linked below. Uh, but basically, all we need to do is firstly hook up the batteries to the TP4056 charging IC. So I firstly selected a position for the batteries, such that the weight would be evenly distributed across the whole board. Uh, then and I secured the batteries into place with hot glue. The next step was to change out the onboard LEDs of the TP4056IC uh, with regular colored LEDs that we're used to, which will go into the cutouts I made earlier. And if you're confused at this point, uh, basically the IC has two onboard LEDs, one that's red for charging and one that's blue for fully charged. Now, since those LEDs will not be visible for me uh, inside the enclosure, what you can actually do is desolder them and run wires from them uh, to regular LEDs that I made the cutouts for. So the right pad is for the charged up LED, so the blue one, and the left one is for charging, which goes to the red LED. The top pad for both is the positive and the bottom is the ground. So after desoldering and attaching the wires to the correct LEDs, by the way, flux can be really useful when desoldering, uh, I then inserted them into the cutouts I made earlier. After that, I just did a quick test with a power bank to see if the connections were solid, which they seemed like they were. Then I soldered wires to the battery plus and battery minus spots on the IC, ran them to the battery and soldered them there. Now that all the connections were made, all that was left was to hot glue everything into place uh, which is what I did. And after doing that, all the charging apparatus is secure, so we can move on. The next step is the wiring for the boost converter, the main switch, and the connection to the actual driver board. Uh, so all that's happening here is that power is going from the batteries to the boost converter, which converts the voltage of the batteries to 12 volts, which is needed to power the board. The switch gets wired in between those connections and will cut the power to the board. Then the output of the boost converter, which will be 12 volts now, will get hooked up to the actual driver board and thus power it. So to power the board, what we can do is simply look under the main DC jack, which will have two prongs, uh, one for positive and one for ground. And since there are no markings to identify which one is which, uh, what we can do is plug in the board using a 12 volt power supply uh, and then just use a multimeter to check the polarity. Uh, if you get a negative voltage reading on your multimeter, that means the polarity is opposite. If not, then that's the correct polarity. So after identifying the polarity of the prongs, we can solder a wire to each and run those through the board. Now be careful here, do not hook them up to the output of the boost 
boost converter now, unless you've already set the output voltage of the boost converter to 12 volts. If you haven't, set that first. So to do that, I soldered on the batteries to the boost converter with one of the wires running through the switch. Uh, after that, I got my multimeter and a screw to set the output voltage of the boost converter to 12 volts using the onboard potentiometer. And with that, we can safely hook up the wires from the board to the output of the boost converter, which is what I did next. And at this point, the whole thing should be fully functional on battery power after you plug in the display. Uh, but just to add the finishing touches, we still have to secure the driver board, the control board, and the inverter circuit to the board. So that's exactly what I did next with Hawk Lou. And after everything was secure, I realized I did forget something, which is the power on button. Remember that? So I actually didn't have a push button which was long enough to go through the MDF. All I had were these regular push buttons, the same ones as the one on the control board. So my solution was to just use that and whenever I needed to push the button, I could simply just use a pencil or a toothpick or something else like that uh, to go through the MDF and press it. Kind of a crappy solution, but I'm not gonna be using the button much anyway, so it's fine. Then I proceeded by gluing that into its cutout and then soldering the wires to it and running them to the actual button on the driver board and soldering them there. And at this point, the whole thing should be fully functional both on battery power and plugged in. All we need to do is hook up the display. So I then plugged in the back connector to the back of the display as well as the backlight connector to the inverter circuit. Those two wires I actually had to extend because they weren't long enough uh, but after those two were plugged in I closed up everything, put some transparent tape on to secure the display piece. I didn't want to use screws or nails uh, and did a test run with my Raspberry Pi which turned out to be successful. And at this point everything is technically complete. It's fully functional both on plugged in and battery power uh, and this could be the final step for you but as I mentioned before I do plan on wall mounting this and hooking it up to my laptop so let's do that. Now the problem I have is that the viewing angles of this display are extremely poor. You need to be looking straight at it for the best colors. So if I wall mount it flat the colors for my seat will be off. Uh, so what I need is for it to be slightly angled towards me which is the reason I can't use screws for this. A solution is to use string or wire to hang it like this producing the small angle that I need. So what I did was I used wire and locked it into the locking screw holes that I made earlier then I could just simply hang it like a picture. But now I had yet another problem which was that there was no stud behind the wall at the point where I wanted to hang the thing. I checked where the studs were beforehand with a stud finder so that's how I knew. Fortunately however these things called drywall anchors which go straight into drywall exist so I went and got some of those. So what you do is firstly just screw in the big white piece into the drywall uh, followed by the actual metal screw which goes inside it and you're done. After that I just hung the display on the screw, adjusted it till it was straight and now I could plug it into my laptop. Right? Well once again there is a small problem, which is that the HDMI port on my laptop is already occupied with my main display. I also don't happen to have any other ports on my laptop to connect to a display like VGA or DVI. So I'm stuck, I guess. Built this whole thing for nothing. Well, that, that kind of sucks. But anyways, hope it helped you. Thanks for watching. Nah, just joking. Of course, I thought of this beforehand, and the solution is, of course, an adapter. So I contacted StarTech, who make adapters, cables, and other computer accessories like that, and they were kind enough to send me their USB 3 to HDMI adapter, which is exactly what I needed. So big thank you to them for sending this over and making this dual monitor setup possible. So the working of the adapter is pretty simple. You have a USB 3 port on one end and a female HDMI on the other, so all you do is plug in the adapter into the USB 3 port on your PC, and it basically just acts like another HDMI port, which is exactly what I need. And what's awesome is that you don't actually lose a USB port to this. It actually has an onboard USB 3 port, which is great to see. The only real downside is that it works only with Windows and not Mac or Linux, uh, but since I'm a Windows user, it's all good for me. So after installing the provided drivers, I simply plugged in the adapter to my PC and the HDMI cable from the display into the adapter and everything worked like a charm. The resolution may initially be off depending on the display, so you can just reset it in the taskbar settings, and from there you can do a bunch of other cool stuff too, like extend the display to any direction. Uh, so since my display is above my main display, I extend it to the top. You also have the options of duplicating the display, which would be useful for someone like giving a presentation, as well as changing the orientation of the screen. And in terms of lag or delay, since that's something people might be concerned about, I couldn't notice any delay or lag. Uh, High-res videos were completely fine too. Heck, even games were completely fine, so performance is not something you need to worry about. So I was really pleased with this adapter, and if you're looking for the same thing, I've linked it in the description so you can check it out. And on that note, the whole setup is finally complete. Uh, if you guys are wondering about the battery life, it's actually quite decent with 2 hours and 15 minutes on a single charge in my testing, and of course you can extend that anytime just by adding more batteries in parallel or using a power bank if you don't want to do that, but for me, it's more than enough. I'm actually really quite pleased with how this turned out, not only is having a second display awesome, but the portability is a 
whole another level of awesome, allowing you to watch a movie on it or, you know, waste a couple hours of your time in Call of Duty at your very own convenience. And this is also a very economical project too. I'll leave a parts list below, but the total cost of this should be about $50. Uh, if you can get a display from a friend's old laptop like I did, and that's really cheap considering that it's also battery powered. If you look up portable displays for sale online, they'll be both more expensive than this and will not be battery powered. So yeah, I'd encourage you to build this because it's cheap, extremely useful, and a ton of fun to actually put together. And with that, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed and learned something. Also big thank you to StarTech for providing the awesome adapter to Great Scott, who has a fantastic channel by the way, you should go check it out for his portable monitor video, and to my friend for giving me his dead laptop. Talk to you guys later.